And good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon, Monday, November 16th, 2020. My name is Johanna Fernandez. I'm an associate professor of history at Baruch College of the City University of New York. And I'm one of the hundreds of people who have been leading a movement to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, the imprisoned radio journalist and former Black Panther. Uh, one of many, many people around the world uh, struggling to free him, but also other political prisoners. There is an urgent matter that we must immediately tend to. And we are interrupting the uh, flow of this press conference to bring this information to you. I will remind everyone that in the spring of 2015, Mumia Abu-Jamal fainted in the infirmary. And it took an international movement of very dedicated people to save his life. We have an urgent emergency. And this is uh, off the press. And I will read you a message, an urgent medical message about a beloved prisoner in Pennsylvania. Urgent action is needed, it says. Our beloved elder, Russell Maroon Schultz, suffering stage four cancer for the last year and a half has now been diagnosed with COVID-19. This infection is no doubt a result of the full-blown resurgence of the virus in Pennsylvania state prisons and the callous disregard shown by prison authorities to elderly and infirm incarcerated people, including withheld testing and unhygienic isolation of those who report symptoms. Maroon is asking that all supporters call the office of Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf and demand his immediate unconditional release, as well as that of all elderly prisoners infected with COVID-19. Please call this number you see on screen immediately, beginning this morning, Monday, November 16th, 2020, and keep the pressure on. Our sincere gratitude for all of your support, and this is signed by Russell uh, Schultz Jr., the son of Russell Maroon Schultz, uh, who's in Pennsylvania's prisons as we speak, um, an elder political prisoner who we want to bring home because we will not accept uh, the killing of Russell Maroon Schultz on account of the state and its refusal to decarcerate in a moment when the COVID crisis and the COVID pandemic is essentially a life sentence for so many prisoners, especially our beloved uh, Russell Maroon Schultz. So please, the call is to immediately put the pressure on the governor, but also on the Department of Corrections by calling 717-787 Two five zero zero. Thank you so very much for uh, for that. And before we start, I'd like to just thank all of those who participated in putting together this important conference. And before we move forward, I'd like to announce that we have a very special presentation by a very special historic actor in American society today. And that special presentation is gonna come at the end of the press conference. But I'd like to acknowledge the folks who have contributed to putting this press conference together. And those people include, of course, Mobilization for Mumia, Black Lives Matter Philadelphia, Black Philadelphia Radical Collective, Black Alliance for Peace, Common Notion Books, Yale Justice Collaboratory, 
No Cops Union, Yale Greenhaven Prison Project, Workers World Party, uh, the YLS MLSA, those are the folks from Yale Law School, quite a number of organizations from Yale Law School, including uh, its chapter of the National Lawyers Guild, the National Lawyers Guild, the YLS Defender Society, Quinnipiac National Lawyers Guild, Connecticut Bail Fund, YLS Capital Assistance Project, YLS Law and Political Economy, Minority Pre-Law Association at Dartmouth, International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu Jamal, FGP, LLSA, and Jim, uh, the campaign to bring Mumia home and uh, the Free Mumia Coalition, NYC, among others. Thank you all for helping us to put this event together. Uh, I wanna start by saying that in the 19th century, the United States was the largest producer of cotton in the world. And of course, that cotton was produced by enslaved Africans. In the late 19th century, the United States was producing steel. In the 1950s, the United States was producing automobiles. And today, in the late 20th century and 21st century, the United States is producing prisoners and a carceral state. Imprisonment and the prison uh, apparatus, the carceral apparatus is the third largest employer in the United States, third only to Walmart and Manpower Inc. That is a catastrophe of epic proportion. The people who have been disproportionately imprisoned uh, in this period are black Americans and in increasingly Latinos. Now, why do I start with this? Because there was a generation of black radicals who in the 1960s called attention to the fact that incarceration would be the new face of white supremacy and racism in the United States after the embers of the urban rebellions of the 60s cooled off. Those radicals include Mumia Abu-Jamal, members of the Black Panther Party, and over a dozen Black Panthers uh, who are today imprisoned. The people who rang the alarm in the 1960s against the law and order campaigns deployed against the Black Freedom Movement, the Black Power Movement, and Black Radicals, who said they are going to transform the project of racism uh, from segregation and lynchings in the South to our mass imprisonment, those people were targeted by the state and imprisoned. And today, as a new uh, generation of Black freedom fighters emerge, they too are being targeted by the state for political reasons. Anthony Smith from Philadelphia, a beloved teacher and organizer in the Black Philadelphia Radical Collective is one of those victims of targeting on the part of the state for uh, his uh, struggles against black freedom. One of the people who, were tar who was targeted by the state, we know as the award-winning radio journalist, uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, who spent 28 and a half years in the harrowing torture of death row, he was imprisoned in 1981 and sent to death row in 1982. But in 2011, after 28 and a half years on death row, a federal court ruled that the DA's office in Philadelphia had obtained a death penalty in his case unconstitutionally through trickery. That year, his sentence was commuted to life in prison without parole and this year marks the 39th winter of Mumia's imprisonment. For over two decades, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has refused to hear even one of the over 21 constitutional violations in Mumia's case. Why? Because its chief judge, Ronald Castile, was irreparably biased, the man who appointed himself to 
here, Mumia's appeals, which were to discuss the violations in his case, uh, this man, Ronald Castile, was unduly influenced by the Fraternal Order of Police, the institution most emphatically committed to Mumia's imprisonment and execution. How was Judge Ron Castile's judgeship a problem? Why should he have recused himself uh, from hearing Mumia's appeals? Because he was funded by the Fraternal Order of Police uh, and he was named Man of the Year by the Fraternal Order of Police the same institution that has attempted to get Mumia uh, first executed um, and uh, who wants Mumia to continue to be imprisoned. And if this weren't bad enough, uh, Ronald Castile was both prosecutor and judge in Mumia's case. Uh, and this is why we're here today, because a landmark Supreme Court ruling in 2016, Williams versus Pennsylvania finally established the parameters of judicial bias. It essentially said that you cannot be both prosecutor and judge in the same case. And a judge, Leon Tucker of the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas, essentially established that that's exactly what happened in Mumia's case. And he ordered all of Mumia's uh, uh, issues that he presented on appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court reopened. And what has happened since? Uh, the widow of the fallen officer that Mumia Abu Jamal is wrongfully accused of killing uh, Daniel Faulkner has filed a rare petition to stop all of the decisions of the lower courts and intervene uh, in uh, Mumia's case. And we are going to talk about why that is happening and what is the new evidence that has emerged in Mumia's case that has the Fraternal Order of Police, the entire establishment of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and the Fraternal Order of Police running because they know that if the new evidence that has just emerged in this case sees the light of day, Mumia will walk and the entire apparatus of mass incarceration in the United States and Pennsylvania will be exposed. Uh, and the framing of Mumia will be exposed once and for all. I want to now turn to our first speaker uh, our first speaker is uh, someone I've known for uh, more than two decades now. Uh, she is the person who has singularly kept the case of Mumia Abu Jamal alive in the public sphere through thick and thin, through, th through highs and lows, um, and that is Pam Africa. Pam Africa is the Minister of Confrontation of the MOVE organization. She is the pair chairwoman uh, and uh, she's the part of the uncompromising international concern family and friends of Mumia Abu Jamal. So I'd like to open up the floor to um, the powerful Pam Africa. On a move, thank you, Johanna, and thanks to everyone who's participating um, today. And uh, we have here a case clearly, factually, a case of judicial, prosecutorial, and police misconduct. I like to add terrorism to that. And uh, But Mumia, no, um, the district attorney, Krasner, has released 15 people and uh, dealing with judicial and prosecutorial uh, misconduct. Mumia, you know, who has been you know, on the foregrounds and Krasner know about his case, has not released Mumia. We must demand that Krasner do for Mumia what he did for the other 15 exonerees, 13 black, one white, and one Latino. Um, you know, we're asking people to help us stop the plot, stop the plan. It's clear that they're trying to kill this innocent man. Fifteen cases. Um, and just before the King's Bench Act, which someone else would talk about, you know, later, and you know, just before then, he could have 
you know, release Mumia. And, uh, and you know, I can't express enough. Mumia is very ill in that prison, not like he was two years ago. Mumia's liver, and uh, he has cirrhosis of the liver, and uh, he's under the COVID that, you know, everyone else is under inside them prisons. And, uh, um, and the thing is, he should be on the street based on evidence. We need to immediately put pressure and demand that Krasner release Mumia based on judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. And Mumia don't have to come back to court because Krasner released two of the prisoners and all from prison. They never came back to court. So, um, you know, I can't express this enough. The plots, the failed plots for 39 years where they tried to kill Mumia, if it wasn't for a judge in Scranton and the movement, and uh, Mumia will be dead today. And uh, because the um, prison officials was in a plot that got exposed inside the prison, I mean, inside the courtroom before you know, a lot of people that, um, you know, they were manipulating papers to kill him. So we're not just talking about judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. We're talking about a plot, a continuous plot, to try to kill Mumia. Um, so everyone else is going to speak on, you know, details of what it is that I'm talking about. Um, so I'm saying, on the move, long live revolution, and free Mumia Abu-Jamal, a black political prisoner on death row, who is a world-renowned journalist as well. Thank you, on the move. Thank you so very much, Pam Africa. Pam Africa is uh, having to leave us for health reasons in her family. Uh, but I just want to remind everyone that she was referring to uh, bribery on the part of the prosecutor's uh, office in the case of Mumia Abu Jamal, the bribery of witnesses to obtain a conviction. And she was also referring to what we discovered in court when Mumia fell ill uh, with hepatitis C. We sued in court and we learned as the case was developing in court that the Department of Corrections had attempted to manipulate their own doctor to say that Mumia's critical case of hepatitis C was not really serious. And in court, that doctor said, oh, no, 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 no. You, would, you tried to get me to say that Mumia was not seriously ill but the science and the record suggests that he is. Uh, at that point, the judge intervened and said, y'all have to figure this out because someone is about to perjure themselves and there are gonna be serious problems uh, uh, in the case. Eventually we won and we got Mumia the uh, health uh, services and care he needed. And as a result of this health lawsuit, other prisoners across the country are now using Mumia's case to sue for treatment of hepatitis C. We are now going to turn to a video that was produced overnight, very quickly, by two students at the May Day space where I'm teaching a course on race and Black liberation. Their names are Graham Carter and Mia Shmariahu. They prepared this, uh, this video on the case. It was just delivered to us like three minutes ago. Thank you. That's the one, the one that begins with Democracy Now! that we're about to show. Can we roll the first video? Can you put this from the beginning and also give a sound? And can you widen the...
1982, Mumia Abu-Jamal was sentenced to die for killing Philadelphia police officer Daniel Faulkner. He's always maintained his innocence as perhaps America's most famous prisoner. The many problems in Mumia's case plague thousands of cases every day in our court system. People really don't understand what the climate was in Philadelphia in the years before Mumia was arrested. Because if they did, they would look at his arrest and his trial in a different fashion. The U.S. Department of Justice filed suit against the city of Philadelphia, its mayor, and other officials, charging they allowed constant brutality in the city police department. That legacy of police brutality is parallel to an equally ugly legacy of corruption. A federal grand jury indicted 13 Philadelphia police officers. One of the biggest cases of police corruption in modern United States. In Philadelphia today, seven former policemen were found guilty of corruption. Shortly after the Jamal case had gone to trial, the federal government prosecuted the police department in Philadelphia for corruption. 15 of the cops who worked on Mumia's investigation went down on FBI convictions. It was bribery, extortion, manufacturing of evidence to win convictions, all the things that would lead to the kind of um, faking of evidence that we know went on in the Jamal case. Pedro Palakoff, a freelance photographer, was one of the first persons at the scene of the crime. His photographs were dismissed by the prosecution. And there's the guns in the officer's hands. If this photograph was presented in court, they would have dismissed that evidence instantly as contaminated. Apparently, the path that I took to come around the scene to get photos put me right through where a taxi cab was supposed to be that a witness was in. There's no taxi cab there. There was no cab driver that anybody was talking to and I walked right past the cruiser in order to take the photograph. The single most important fact people should know about this case is that there was a fourth person at the crime scene. And the presence of that person at trial was suppressed by the prosecutor, Joe McGill. I was standing on a corner of 12 and Locus, this chit-chatting girl talk, and then we heard gunshots. And I looked across the street to my like, left ankle, and I seen this white person falling. And I kept looking, and I seen these two black individuals running away from him. And regardless of what anybody says, I know what I saw. These eyes don't miss too much, not too much. A few months before Veronica Jones was scheduled to testify in the Abu Jamal trial, she was arrested and jailed on a robbery charge. I couldn't make the bail. They were telling me <clears throat> how they could work a deal with me. They told me all I had to do was name Mubia as the shooter, Mubia Jamal as the shooter, and that they would make sure that I would got off more than 15 years, to five to 15 years. I was totally confused. I didn't know what to say. I'm looking at a man I've never seen in my life that I'm getting ready to lie on. And I'm looking at these officers that can put me away. So I just thought I just said it's anything. I'm sorry. And again, this is the intimidation that these people have used on people like Veronica Jones. They're talking about the FOP history, this government history. And again, it points to what liars and bullies these people are. Uh, there's the blacks from the uh, low income areas are less likely to convict. And as a result, you don't want those people on your jury. The elimination of blacks from juries is, is a problem all over the country. McMahon's tape, unfortunately, uh, detailed a common practice. The experience of black people with police is different. They're much more skeptical of police testimony. So to have blacks on your jury means that they're not going to accept everything that the police officer says just out of hand. And I think whites have a very different uh, experience with police officers in this country. But when you look at the context of police brutality in Philadelphia, in the context of systemic injustice in Philadelphia, what happened to Momia happens to so many other people. And the reason why we are here, really, 
is because approximately one year ago, there was a great discovery in this case. New exculpatory evidence in the case of Mumia Abu Jamal that says and suggests clearly that the main witness was bought off by the cops and by the prosecutor to finger Mumia. For our family, we've like been on hold waiting for Mumia to come home. We expect Mumia to come home. Uh, that was a that was an excerpt of the film Justice on Trial: The Case of Omi Abu Jamal. This excerpt was uh, produced and edited by Graham Carter and Mia Shmariahu. Uh, and part of what we discovered uh, in the last three years, when Mumia's uh, case was in court, uh, was that not only was there judicial misconduct and bias. Uh, we also discovered six boxes with uh, exculpatory evidence in it. And that is the subject in part that we are going to hear about from Lynn Washington. Uh, Lynn Washington Jr. is a professor of journalism at Temple University. He's going to talk to us about the King's Bench petition, which has stayed all of the proceedings of the lower court, which have given the go ahead to reopen uh, the issues that Mumia presented on appeal to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court between the 1990s and like 2007 or 2009. So we welcome Lynn Washington Jr. Professor of Journalism at Temple University. Uh, good afternoon, Joanna. I thank you for having me uh, as a part of this. The King's Bench uh, is a a power that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has to be able to intervene in matters, even matters that are not before the court. This particular power is supposed to be done in only extraordinary instances of the public interest. What the Pennsylvania Supreme Court did was to involve itself by granting a petition filed by the Fraternal Order Police, which is involved in corruption in this case, as well as the widow whose mindset is that Mumia did it and I don't wanna hear anything else beyond that. The fact that the Pennsylvania Supreme Court granted King's Bench authority to look at a really tangential and nonsensical aspect in this case, when part of the problem with this case is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court itself just shows the corrupted nature of what Mumia has uh, endured. Just quickly, let's understand the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. A few months ago, the Chief Justice was uh, put under investigation for initiating a racist revenge effort against a former member of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court who just happened to be a black female. Months, uh, years before that, two members of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had to resigned because they engaged in sending out racist and uh, homophobic and misogynistic emails with members of the Pennsylvania's Attorney General's office. So we could see very clearly from where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court got involved with this King's Bench is that uh, it is a corrupted process. And the fact that it has been such a corrupted process for almost 40 years is the reason why this press conference is taking place today because Mumia has been victimized by that. Let me jump ahead to these boxes that were discovered. When the current DA, Larry Krasner, uh, entered office in, uh, I think it was January of 2019, he was looking around, seeing physically how the office was laid out. They were looking for some furniture. They went to a subfloor, a floor between two floors that they didn't even realize existed. And in this, storage room, they found six boxes of evidence. Now, by law, that evidence should have been given to the defense 
either during the 1982 trial, and if it wasn't during the 82 trial, at least during the 1995 appeals, and if not, the proceedings during this particular uh, century, the 21st century. So the boxes, the existence of the boxes alone is more evidence of corrupted behavior by the prosecutors and by the judges, uh, except for <laughs> Judge Leon Tucker, who in this whole mess over all of these decades is the first judge to use the word justice as it applies to Mumia Abu-Jamal. I wanna just talk about three items that were in those boxes. One involved uh, one of the prosecution's witness, the other involved the uh, procedures that the district attorney used, and another involved me. The district attorney's office initiated an investigation of me a reporter in an effort to discredit my reporting on this case. They checked with the FBI, they couldn't find any criminal conduct or anything that I've done wrong because I don't. What I do is report. I don't engage in criminal activity, unlike the police and the prosecutors in this case and also the judges. Now in the case, the matter involving the cab driver, uh, Robert Chober, there is a letter there where he wrote to the district attorney in the case, a guy named Joe McGill, one of the persons who's involved in this King's bench. And the letter was very short and sweet. Where's my money? Well, what does that mean? You're asking the prosecutor, where's my money? Chobert has testified in court that McGill promised to get him his license back uh, because let's understand when um, Chobert was at the scene of the crime in 1981, he was driving on a suspended license and he was also on probation for firebombing a school. Now, if somebody who's on probation and driving without a license, would that be somebody who drove up behind the car, the, the police officer's car as he testified in court? No, absolutely not. Also in these boxes is a statement from a police officer who was assigned to, to go with Chobert from the crime scene in Chobert's cab down to homicide to be investigated. Now there's no crime scene photos as was noted in this video of Chobert's cab anywhere at the scene. If it was, then the removal of the cab is tampering with evidence, Mumia should get a new trial. So we have Chobert with this letter saying, where's my money? Uh, exposing corruption on the part of the DA and also undermining the credibility of his tainted testimony even further. The last item uh, that I will address involves notes from the prosecutor where he meticulously kept notes on the race of the potential jurors. He struck 10 of the jurors from the pool. Abu Jamal's jury only had two blacks on it and they removed one of them with a uh, corrupted a process. So in past practice, the existence of such notes shows that the prosecutors were engaging in illegal conduct. They were conscientiously excluding Blacks from the jury. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, in the 1995 appeal hearing, very important appeal hearing, Abu Jamal's defense attempted to present materials showing that the jury selection was a corrupted process. The judge in the case, the notorious Albert Sabo, blocked that evidence from coming into court. So much so that he actually incarcerated one of Mumia's attorneys who kept pushing for this evidence to come forward. When this matter got into the federal court, the federal district court judge just blew it off, just blithely blew it off when this was a matter that could have absolutely unequivocally given Mumia a new trial. When it got up to the appeals court level, the appeals court majority, that was two members of a three member panel said, eh, no harm, no foul, no big deal. But you, the defense were at fault for not presenting this evidence, the evidence that Sabo blocked. That decision was so outrageous that the third member of that panel wrote a 64 page dissent the first dissent ever in a Mumia case where he criticized his fellow uh, jurors saying that Mumia should get some relief. So for any and all of the above, you can see very clearly how 
there has been a pattern of corrupted process in the Abu Jamal case that screams injustice. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much, Lynn Washington. I'll repeat that just in case you didn't hear. And that's that uh, the police department investigated Lynn Washington for his reporting on the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. And that is part of the file uh, and the files that have been uh, recovered mysteriously in the last number of years when uh, Leon Tucker uh, demanded that the files in Mumia's case that were sitting in the DA's office be released because he needed that to prove that there was uh, judicial bias on the part of Ronald Castile at the 11th hour. Uh, six boxes emerge, uh, and they're in some middle, in between two floors in the DA's office, six boxes with Mumia's name on them, with uh, evidence of bribery, but also evidence that proves the Batson claim, which Mumia has litigated before the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the Batson claim in the post-civil rights movement era is very important. It establishes that if there is judicial, uh, if there is uh, racial bias in the selection of jurors, and, and all you need to do is look at the case, and if superficially there is um, suggestion of racial bias in jury selection, the, the case should either be thrown out or there should immediately be a, a new trial. Mumia has put this before the court previously, but because of the Mumia exception, because the courts uh, are willing to undo precedent in order to keep Mumia from gaining uh, relief, they denied him the Batson trial and in fact, when he was at the Third Circuit Court, there was a judge who dissented on the decision of that court on this issue of Batson. And that judge, Judge Tom Ambro of the Third Circuit Court on the issue of Batson and discrimination in jury selection said, I see no reason why this court should not afford Abu Jamal the courtesy of our presidents, unquote, meaning that in previous cases where defendants have presented this issue to us with the same evidence, we've granted them relief. So why are we denying Abu Jamal um, the same courtesy? I see no reason why this is happening. Uh, and of course, now that the new evidence proves that there was discrimination in jury selection, the Philadelphia establishment, the Fraternal Order of Police, um, they're running scared and they're trying to stop discovery um, from happening of this new evidence because now this new evidence, six boxes, have to be put through the courts uh, and uh, examined and reviewed for legitimacy. And that's what we are fighting for in this moment. And that's why the powers that be have stayed the process. Um, I'd like to now welcome Kwame Ajamu. Uh, Kwame Ajamu is an Ohio death row exoneree. He's also the chairman um, of the board of Witness to Innocence. Kwame Ajamu, I think you have to unmute yourself. And perhaps Lynn Washington should mute himself. Kwame, we still do not hear you. You hear me now? Uh, we do indeed. And we'd Thank love you. to see your camera if that's at all possible. Uh, yeah. So sorry. Uh, there we go. All right. So um, as for mentioned, I am Kwame uh, Kamala Jamu, uh, chairman of Witness to Innocence, which is the um, 
organization of uh, nationalities that um, is comprised of uh, both uh, death row exonerees and uh, its leadership is uh, that also. Um, we um, have an intention and a desire and a strong uh, mission to um, stop capital punishment in its tracks to end uh, the death penalty. And uh, this is what we do. I am a survivor from uh, years gone by. 1975 was a year of which I had been, I'd like to say, accosted by uh, Cuyahoga County Police in Cleveland, Ohio. At the tender age of 17, sentenced to die for a crime of which I didn't do. Um, you wanna talk about uh, terror, uh, a disruption of uh, your mental uh, facilities. All these things happened to me as a child, a young man child, as I was ushered off by uh, Cleveland police who uh, did one of those famous pre-dawn raids in my mother's house, uh, guns, shotguns, drawed. Um, I wasn't actually uh, a part of the raid. Uh, they came to get my brother and my friend, as it was three of us who was arrested and uh, sentenced to die that day. Um, but what happened with me was that uh, because the guns was drawn and I knew that my mother was uh, uh, being uh, victimized as such, I uh, apprehended uh, uh, one of the cops, you know, from getting close to her and cursed him out and they um, roughed me up a bit and took me in. It would take 12 days uh, before I was written into uh, the scene of the crime and thus committed um, uh, to uh, the Ohio um, adult uh, prison system for 28 years, three years of which I spent on death row. Uh, my objections to uh, the brother um, Mumia being uh, falsely accused, uh, sentenced to die, a uh, political prisoner, um, one of the millions and uh, hundreds of thousands of black men who have been um, so critically um, victimized by the state, especially uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, uh, is that um, not only is it just so wrong, uh, but you know, uh, no one looks at the fact that this is a human being. You know, this man is capable of being one of the greater uh, or foremost teachers uh, of that our society right now could know uh, had he give, been given the opportunities uh, to walk in that path uh, of righteousness. Uh, I think that uh, Brother uh, Jamal has been so wrongly, um, not only um, in his convictions, but mistreated as a human being and disrespected as a man. Um, and I, I would stand behind this brother uh, to all eternities. Um, and when a society like Philadelphia, uh, which is married to Cleveland, I might say in Ohio. Um, when I was arrested in 1975, the uh, city of Cleveland was just coming out of uh, two major uh, disruptions uh, on the violent side with the cops and um, the residents, uh, the Glenville riot and the Huff riots. And uh, it left a real bad smear uh, in our communities. Uh, the cops were just jumping out, doing what they wanted to do. And uh, it was like that just about in 1975 when I was arrested. Um, there's a long history of uh, the uh, political scene of people being um, uh, sentenced to die right around October, November, uh, December, when it's time for the elections to happen over here in Ohio. And, uh, you know, as such, it happened to me and my brother and my good friend as well. You know, uh, my case happened in May, but I was sitting to die late September, you know, um, the same time that the judge and the prosecutor was going up for re-election, uh, to which they were, in fact, re-elected. And I'm quite sure, I don't know the Philadelphia scene like that, but I'm quite sure that politically um, it's like that. Um, why would uh, this judge Sabo say, uh, I'm going to help them get, and he used the N word with reference to this brother. Why would he say that, them? I'm going to help them. Who is them? You know, it gives me the impression that they are all uh, in cahoots together. Not gives me the impression, but it said um, that they are all in cahoots together. And then uh, the situation with the, um, the young sister, uh, Veronica Jones, you know, just on and on and how they, they uh, his brother's terrified, you know, if they uh, got the man's brother afraid to live his life. Uh, this is something beyond just uh, a cop getting shot or 
uh, an individual being charged in the shooting of a police officer. Um, a brother, uh, Mamil Abdul-Jamal may very well be uh, not only a political uh, prison, but he could very well be a scapegoat as well. You know, what was that cop into? These are the questions that comes to my mind on things like this happen when you have an entire uh, judicial system in a city uh, doing all they can to cover up this man, um, uh, Mr. Trial, uh, Ms. Justice and Trial. And uh, so what was the cop into, you know, and why don't we hear nothing else about this cop and what his life was, you know? Oh yeah, uh, he was a great guy, you know, and, and he gave him honors and all this, but no, something uh, is far more missed than that. And I'm thinking that uh, this is why this brother is being so treated uh, the way he is. And, and I adore that, I really do. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Brother Kwame Ajamu. We are now going to turn to Greg Gonzalez before Dwayne Betts because Greg is a professor at Yale Law School and he might have to go teach a class. Uh, he's also assistant professor at Yale School of Public Health and co-director of the Yale Law Global Health Justice Partnership. Greg Gonzalez, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I wanna broaden this out, this discussion to the plight of prisoners, people who are incarcerated uh, across the United States in the context of the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, the largest clusters of COVID-19 in the country are in prisons and jails in the United States. Um, and there is no way to keep people safe in prisons and jails. These are congregate facilities like cruise ships uh, and, and other tightly packed um, uh, venues in which it's very difficult to social distance, where mask wearing uh, can't be readily enforced, where communal activities like showering or eating meals um, necessitates people being together. Prisons push people into the path of epidemics and it's no different than with, with COVID-19. And so many of us have been working around the country to ensure that prisoners, including uh, uh, Mumia, uh, are released from prison because this um, pandemic is putting their lives at risk, um, particularly for older prisoners and prisoners with underlying conditions, whether it's diabetes or asthma or any sort of immunocompromised condition such as cirrhosis or uh, uh, a history of cancer. And so um, I think let's elevate this to talk about every prisoner in this country who is now in jail and at his risk of contracting SARS-CoV-2 as a new wave of this virus sweeps over the nation. We'll have a million cases this week, a million new cases, and many of them are gonna be in prisons and jails. And so there's no way to keep people safe, but by decarcerating and letting people out uh, uh, compassionately because nobody um, deserves to die from SARS-CoV-2 uh, when we can keep them safe by letting them out into the community uh, uh, to, to live their lives free from the virus. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Professor Gonzalez, for joining us uh, this afternoon. And we'd like to remind everybody that there is a crisis with at least one prisoner. And that is the case of Russell Maroon Schultz, who's suffering stage four cancer. He's been suffering from stage four cancer for the last year. And he has now been diagnosed with COVID-19 and uh, there's a full blown resurgence of uh, COVID-19 in Pennsylvania. And we're asking the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections to release immediately Russell Maroon Schultz, uh, who's in his 70s or 80s. But we're also joining the call of release aging people in prison, an organization that long ago argued that if a pandemic is to hit the United States, an entire generation of black men aging in prison would be sentenced to death um, by illness. And so we are calling on the United States and governors who have failed to heed the call to decarcerate, probably because Governors are being lobbied and pressured by fratern the Fraternal Order of Police and other police unions. We're calling on governors, the governor of, of Pennsylvania and of California uh, and of New York, 
to decarcerate immediately. Other countries, Turkey, Iran, have decarcerated in this moment. The United States is the only country that has not. We are calling on uh, the United States to decarcerate aging prisoners over the age of 50, but also prisoners with illnesses who are vulnerable to COVID-19. And we're asking for the immediate release of our brother, Russell Maroon Schultz, a political prisoner in Pennsylvania. Uh, and the number to call is 717-787-2500. Once again, 717-787-2500. Uh, and we are now going to turn uh, to Dwayne Betts. Uh, Dwayne Betts is director of the Million Book Project at Yale Law School, which is part of the Yale Law Justice Collaboratory. He's a public defender and an award-winning author. Thank you so very much, um, Dwayne, for joining us. Yeah, it's both a pleasure and an honor to be here, although it's, um, it's always a difficult moment when you contemplate why people deserve to be free and why they aren't. I'll just read a prepared comment. My name is Reginald Dwayne Betts. I am a poet. I am a lawyer. I am a convicted felon. In 1997, I went to prison as a 16 year old. I pleaded guilty to carjacking and was sentenced to nine years. During those years in sales, I discovered Mumia Abu Jamal's writing. I discovered him in the same way that I discovered Asada Shakur and George Jackson and James Foreman Sr. and Stokely Carmichael and H. Rod Brown and Fred Hampton and Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale and Malcolm X and Dr. Angela Davis, who I had an unbelievable honor of sharing this space with today. I discovered them all in books passed to me by men during time in the prisons that sometimes felt like graves. Men named Kufi, Star, Old Head, Divine, Trigger, Fats, Luke, Absolute, Bilal. Men named Snake and Black and Smoke and Jonathan. Men named Ray and Charles and Slim. Men named Pops, Spradley and Pops, Gray. We were incarcerated for violence and most of us were guilty. And yet those books were our mechanism to become more than the crimes that we had committed. We all referred to Mr. Abu Jamal as Mumia, as if we were kin, because we wanted him to be so. The first book I read was Death Blossoms. I bought that book with money earned cleaning floors and toilets in prison for 23 cents an hour. Mumia Abu Jamal went to prison in 1981, a year after I was born. By the time I went to prison, he'd spent 15 years in sales. I've been free for 15 years and he is still incarcerated. Being in prison is a fight to not recede from the memory of those who love you. A fight to keep from receding from the public's memory. I remember Mumia because I remember the men I did time with who are still in prison, still waiting for their freedom. Death blossoms gave me life. I've done a bit. I've graduated from Yale Law School one of the best in the world. I've defended clients in front of judges who were facing time in prison. And now strangely, I'm in a situation here in Connecticut where I'm on a commission that highest prosecutors. The understanding of what it means to be a fair and just society is the center of whatever endeavor I've embarked upon since the day after I pulled a pistol on a man in a parking lot. Many will argue my incarceration wasn't political. A country where more than 2 million people are locked up with sentences in a 30, 40, 50, 60, even 100 year range are considered constitutional. Every one of our state numbers is the mark of a perverse political action. Many people understand Mr. Mumia Abu Jamal as a symbol for the oppressive conditions brought down on a political prisoner. I get that. I believe that. But I think of Mumia and think of Roger Fentress, who did 24 years for a crime he didn't commit before finally being granted a conditional pardon. 
I recognize all the names that we don't know and believe that when I say Mumia's name, I am saying their name as well. I think of a half a dozen names rattling around in my head right now. Men and women who have done decades in prison for crimes they didn't commit or they did commit. And they all deserve to be free. Some of these men are locked up in Pennsylvania. I visited them at Greaterfoot. I know their names. I've exchanged correspondence with them. And I know deeply that they should be free. And so when I stay free, Mumia, it is because a long, long time ago, Mumia became, Mumia became two things for us. A model for cultivating and writing with a fierce intelligence and a symbol for the relentless pursuit of freedom and justice. It's far past time for Mr. Abu Jamal and so many others to re return home to their loved ones. Thank you. Thank you so very much uh, for those poetic words, Dwayne Betts. Uh, when we spoke last night and you said that you had been imprisoned and that Mumia's words brought life to you when you were in solitary, um, it was just moving to, to hear that. But you also said that, that you would speak not just on uh, the framing of Mumia and Mumia's innocence, but you'd speak on all people in prison, regardless of their innocence. Uh, because they're human beings and we live in a, a society that has decided to throw so many black people uh, and so many uh, people who, uh, who were from Latin America uh, away. I wanna recap uh, before we move to our next speaker uh, and partly because we are expecting a very special announcement uh, and presentation uh, from uh, someone who's been fighting against uh, racism and amplifying the struggle against uh, police violence and terror in this country and internationally. Mumia Abu-Jamal uh, is a former Black Panther and imprisoned radio journalist. At the time of his imprisonment, he was an award-winning radio journalist who got a coveted prize for uh, broadcasting from Columbia University for his reporting on the Pope's visit to Philadelphia. And I've often wondered, had Mumia been an award-winning white radio journalist, would we be having this conversation. Mumia was arrested and railroaded in the courts, uh, but he was also framed by a police department who was infamous for its corruption and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions. In 1979, the Department of Justice took over the Philadelphia Police Department. It was the first police department that the Department of Justice investigated. And it concluded that the level of homicidal violence on the part of the Philadelphia police against black and Latino detainees and the level of corruption and bribery and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions on the part of the police, quote, shocks the conscience. You heard earlier that 15 of the 30 or so police officers who collected evidence in Mumia's case went down on a trial and conviction over uh, corruption and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions. But I interviewed, that's not all, I interviewed Jack McMahon um, for uh, the, the film Justice on Trial. Uh, and Jack McMahon is uh, the famous ADA, Assistant District Attorney, who made the infamous McMahon tapes 
training tapes produced for other prosecutors on how to exclude uh, black people from the jury. Part of what Jack McMahon told us was that the cops work hand and glove with the prosecutor's office. And part of what we've learned over the course of 39 years was that the prosecutor's office and the prosecutor, Joe McGill, coerced witnesses um, into confessing that they saw uh, something and that Mumia was the killer. Um, and they, uh, the prosecutor hid evidence, potentially exculpatory evidence. Now, this is known as a Brady violation. Uh, misconduct on the part of the prosecution, when proven, leads to uh, defender, uh, defendants walking. It leads to people getting out of prison. And there are quite a number of Brady violations in Mumia's case. On the issue of uh, police lying and tampering with evidence to frame Umi Abu Jamal, I will say this. Uh, a professor in Germany by the name of Michael Schiffman discovered the Polakoff photographs, the first photographs uh, taken at the crime scene in 1981, um, connected to uh, Mumia's case. Uh, and those photographs show police officer James Forbes mishandling the guns. In court, he was asked if he had properly handled those guns, and he said yes. But of course, the Polakoff photographs uh, were not available then, even though they had been offered at the time of, uh, of, of the crime, they had been offered to the prosecutor's office. The prosecutor's office said, no, we don't need them. I'll remind people from Philadelphia that the infamous prosecutor, elected DA, Lynn Abraham, whom the New York Times identified as America's deadliest DA in the 1990s. Lynn Abraham said, because of course in Philadelphia, every five years, there's this horrific scandal around police corruption, tampering with evidence and lying. And in one of those crises, Lynn Abraham said that if she is to encounter a case in which a police officer lied on the stand, she would immediately dis dismiss the case and let the prisoner go. Well, we have that uh, situation in the case of Mumia Abu Jamal. Officer James Ford lied in the stand saying that he properly handled guns uh, when he did not. Uh, and there is a lot more to say about the ballistics evidence in this case. Uh, but one of the ways that this country and the court system has been able to mass incarcerate so many black and Latino people is through um, police tampering with evidence and prosecutorial uh, misconduct. Uh, I want to now turn, uh, I want to now turn to a very important special human being. Uh, probably the reason why so many of us around the world and around the country are talking about abolition. In 1973, there were approximately 200 and 50 to 300,000 people in prisons. Today, there are 2.4 million people in prison. And we know that the United States incarcerates more people than any other country in the world. Well, in the early 1970s, uh, the person we're about to hear from began to ring the alarm on uh, mass incarceration and proposed that we don't need prisons and that the future uh, was uh, a, a future, the, the, a future worth fighting for uh, is a future without prisons. We know who that person is. Uh, she has been celebrated uh, of late across the country and across the world and finally an idea that seemed impossible in the 1970s and in a previous period has now uh, 
been popularized and mainstreamed because of her work, but also because movements change history. They shift the terms of debate um, and open up a new vision and possibility for organizing our society. And we know that the movement for Black Lives has transformed the way we talk about the police and prisons. But it was Angela Davis who, um, who opened up this conversation in the United States. Angela Davis is many things. Among them, she is Professor Emerita at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Professor Angela Davis, welcome to this press conference. Thank you, Johanna. And I'd like to thank all of the phenomenal speakers who preceded me. I am so grateful for this opportunity to once again register my unwavering support for Mumia Abu-Jamal. He has played such a pivotal role in the processes of popular education that have led us to this critical juncture in what one might call the century and a half year old effort to acknowledge the structural and systemic character of racism and to take seriously demands for abolition, uh, abolition of the death penalty of prisons, of, of police. And so it is right and just that we should accelerate our efforts on this new terrain to finally free our brother comrade. Much attention has been focused on Philadelphia recently from the elections to the police killing of Walter Wallace because he was experiencing a mental health crisis to the arrest by federal agents of the teacher and community activist, Anthony Smith. And we know that barely a week before his arrest, Philadelphia Magazine had applauded um, Anthony Smith's community service and his exceptional leadership. And all around the world, we have followed the work of Anthony Smith's organization, the Black Philadelphia Radical Collective. And, 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 and many of us um, passionately support the 13 demands they have submitted. We know also that the city council in Philadelphia recently offered an apology, an official apology for the 1955 bombing, which killed 11 MOVE members, including five children and, and completely destroyed 61 homes. So I've been asked to briefly discuss Mumia's case in the context of the long history of political repression in this country. And in the context of the utilization of the critical, of the criminal legal system to produce pretexts for incarcerating people who have chosen to develop radical resistance strategies in relation to racist state violence. Uh, Mumia is a relatively younger member of a generation of black radical activists and intellectuals who have challenged the structural and systemic character of racism long before this recognition helped to accelerate efforts to reimagine some of our society's fundamental institutions. Because of our radical stances, we were targeted by the state. In many instances, the state demonized and railroaded countless numbers of black radicals, some of us who were freed, but many of whom have been imprisoned for as many as five or six decades. Mumia was targeted by the Philadelphia police and COINTELPRO, beginning with his membership in the Black Panther Party. His declassified 500 page FBI file shows that the Philadelphia police in consultation with COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO, for many years had tried to peg a crime on Mumia. We also know that at least one third of the police involved in his case were jailed after it was discovered that they had systematically tampered with evidence in large numbers of cases 
across the city of Philadelphia. But I think that few people know that the investigation of the killing of um, Daniel Faulkner, the policeman uh, whom Mumia is accused of killing, that this investigation was conducted not by the homicide unit of the Philadelphia Police Department, but by its civil defense unit, which was the local police arm of J. Edgar Hoover's COINTELPRO. In 1981, Mumia was sentenced to death. And from death row produced brilliant critiques of the prison industrial complex, mass incarceration, capital punishment, and other institutional consequences of racial capitalism. Many of us are aware of the fact that his widely circulated writings have helped to humanize people in prison and people on death row. Like many others of my age, I've been an active supporter of Mumia for many decades. And I've had the honor of speaking on his behalf at United Nations conferences and in other international venues when Mumia, for example, was declared an honorary citizen of Paris. Uh, the last person before him to receive that distinction was Pablo Picasso. I participated in uh, that uh, ceremony in Paris as his surrogate. Leonard Peltier, Mutulu Shakur, Russell Maroon Schultz, Ed Poindexter, Veronica, Veranza uh, Bowers, uh, Romaine Chip Fitzgerald, David Gil Gilbert, and my former co-defendant, Rochelle McGee, are just a few of the US political prisoners who have spent the vast majority of their lives behind bars. And as we know, are currently the most vulnerable with respect to COVID-19. We've already heard about Russell Maroon Schultz's condition. And we've heard Greg Gonsalves emphasize the need for compassionate compassionate decarceration and abolitionist strategy. Thanks to international organizing efforts, Mumia is perhaps the most well-known political prisoner in the world. And these international efforts saved his life when he came dangerously close to execution in 1995. Mumia's case exemplifies the lengths to which the state will go to silence those who speak truth to power. And this is why the Fraternal Order of Police has been unrelenting in its attempt to silence him and his supporters. But now that structures of policing have finally been exposed for their systemic racism, and as we call for justice in the names of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Walter Wallace and so many others, and now that the city of Philadelphia has issued an official apology to move, now is the time to accelerate our campaign to bring Mumia home. Let's not forget that Mumia's identification with move and his empathetic reporting on the city's repression of MOVE rendered him a major target of the Rizzo um, administration. And as you've heard from Johanna and others, um, Lynn Washington, for example, his case is, his, his case is um, a riddle with violations, especially the concealing of ex exculpatory evidence. Uh, uh, the concealing of the presence of Kenneth Freeman at the scene of the killing of Daniel Faulkner, although the prosecutor was aware of the fact that Freeman had been identified as the shooter by four witnesses. And um, the same night of the move bombings, Kenneth Freeman was found dead in a parking lot, gagged and handcuffed. 
We know that there were clear violations in relation to the selection of the jury. A 11 out of the prosecution's 14 peremptory challenges were used to eliminate black jurors. Uh, and of course, this in itself, as has already been pointed out, supports the call for a new trial. The Supreme Court has ruled that the elimination of jurors on the basis of race is a major violation. Um, and as um, Johanna and others have pointed out, newly discovered file boxes in the DA's office, uh, which were there for 37 years or so, contain a list of potential jurors highlighting their race. And perhaps even more egregious are the instructional tapes that have that were produced by ADA Jack McMahon, uh, who uh, pointed out that, um, that um, educated black people should not be selected to serve on uh, the jury. But also, as he said, blacks from the low income area um, are less likely to convict. And as a result, I'm quoting, I don't want these people on, on, on your jury. And as he said, and it may appear that you're being racist or whatnot, but again, you're just being realistic. You're trying to win the case. So finally, the framing of Mumia and his incarceration are part of a larger story of structural racism and repression linked to global capitalism, linked to racial capitalism. Racism drives incarceration and infects policing all over the world from Rio de Janeiro to Johannesburg, to London, to Paris. Here in the US, mass incarceration especially affects indigenous people and black and Latinx communities. And I think we need to emphasize the fact that the very same forces that have driven the creation of the prison industrial complex are responsible for the fact that many people in other countries, in countries of the global south, have seen their home economies destroyed by capitalist incursions. They have no other choice than to flee. Thus the borders and the walls and immigrant detention facilities are integrally linked to racist policing and the prison industrial complex. And I should point out that abolitionist strategies emphasize the connections of all of these institutions. And so finally, at a time when critiques of structural racism are gaining traction and specifically its centrality to policing, we gather here to demand the release of Mumia Abu-Jamal and other political prisoners whose trials and sentences were irreparably influenced by their political uh, beliefs and by their challenges to this very system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Angela Davis, for your remarks and for joining us and for joining us this afternoon. Um, I want to turn immediately to, to our demands. Uh, and I want to invite everyone who's in the press to pose questions uh, to the panel. And the number to call with questions as we open up the press conference is 845-768. 3463. Once again, the questions uh, to pose should be called in to the number 845 768 3463. 845 768 3463. But before that, we'd like to present a series of demands. Uh, and those demands are gonna be presented by someone who has been 
on the ground, making every detail of this press conference possible and, um, and dealing with my carmogeny self uh, throughout this process. And that is a phenomenal human being who uh, learned about Mumia Abu Jamal many moons ago when he was only a child. And uh, he's been in this work ever since. And that's Santiago Alvarez. Hey y'all, thank you, Johanna. Um, and first I just wanna say thank you to all the elders like Angela, Pam, Ramona, Janine, and Janet Africa for teaching us, guiding us, and helping us, the younger generation, as we continue the fight to free our freedom fighters like Mumia, like Russell Maroon Schultz, like many, like Leonard Peltier and many others. Um, and I just want to say that like we should all know that us coming together today is lifting Mumia's spirits. So um, our list of demands are the immediate release of Mumia Abu-Jamal. We demand the immediate release of all political prisoners. We demand the immediate release of our elders, aging prisoners over the age of 50, and others vulnerable to death through COVID-19. We demand the abolition of all prisons and radical and radical socioeconomic redistribution of wealth and transformation of neighborhoods towards a sustainable and life-affirming society. And I would also like to read um, a quote from John Africa. And it says, you can imprison weakness, but you can never imprison strength. There's plenty of evidence of this throughout history. All throughout history, these people have been attempting to imprison water in dams. And all throughout history, the dams have turned to dust, but the water is still wet. For you see, you can jail the powerless, but you cannot jail the powerful. Water does not believe in prison. Water is the power of life. For water flows with the freedom of life. Nobody can stop the power of freedom. And this is why nobody will stop the power of move." End quote. So we wanna say long live John Africa, long live revolution and um, thank you all for being here. I'll turn it back over to you, Johanna. Thank you very much, Santiago, for all of your work and for sharing those demands with us. We want to open up the lines to media questions, and we've already uh, received a few, but we'd like to remind you that you can call your questions in to 845-768. 3463, three. there will be someone answering the call, call there, 845-768-3463. Three, and our first question is from Michael Schiffman, who's calling in uh, from Germany. Uh, he's with T Online, which is Germany's biggest news portal. And his question is, what legal options are left should the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decide to withdraw Krasner from the case? Uh, and I'd like to, I'd like everyone to uh, open their, their cameras uh, and perhaps uh, Lynn Washington can take, to, can take this question. Well, if the Supreme Court um, continues with its corrupted process, removal of DA Krasner will mean that another prosecutor would be assigned to the case. That prosecutor will in all probability be the Attorney General for the state of Pennsylvania. And the proceeding would go forward. So the district attorney's office would be replaced by the state attorney general's office. But the matters that Judge Tucker ordered 
would be litigated. And if they weren't litigated, it's my understanding. And I defer to someone who uh, has more legal insight and acumen than me. It is my understanding that if the matter uh, is quashed by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and when I say quashed, I mean the ability to litigate based on the orders of Judge Tucker, then that could be appealable to the uh, federal judiciary. So this King's Bench investigation only deals with uh, um, the ability of the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office to stay on the case. It does not in any way at this stage crush the case totally. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that we're in fact expecting imminently that special statement that I referred to previously. And while we're waiting for it, and it's expected to come in in about 10 minutes, um, I'd like to remind everyone that there is an urgent call uh, to the Pennsylvania governor to decarcerate and to release Russell Maroon Schultz, a political prisoner who has had cancer for the last year and a half and has just uh, been diagnosed with COVID. Um, that's Russell Maroon Schultz, who's been imprisoned for decades, an elderly uh, man uh, in his 70s or 80s. Uh, and the number to call is 717-787-2500. We are standing with uh, the call for decarceration um, of abolitionists across the country and across the world, especially in this moment um, of pandemic, but also the call to immediately release aging people in prison. And that's the name of an organization, RAP, Release Aging People in Prison, that's been working on these issues for at least 10 years. So we're asking you um, to, to uphold this demand to go find the organization Release Aging People in Prison, but also to call for the immediate release of prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz, and you should call the governor of Pennsylvania, 717-787-2500, 717-787-2500, but also call your governor if you're in California or in Ohio or in New York and ask governors uh, who've been, uh, essentially taken a step back on these, this issue of decarceration to decarcerate. You can't be against racism and not be against the structural racism of the 21st and, 20, uh, and late 20th century, which is essentially hyper-imprisonment, the hyper-imprisonment of Black Americans and Latinx people. Uh, we're uh, going to uh, pose another question. The, the other question is, uh, it's a response. Th this would make Mumia's legal future uh, look pretty gloomy, wouldn't it? That's if the Pennsylvania Supreme Court decides to withdraw Krasner from the case. Um, all the more so since the case would be handed to the attorney general's office and they have already indicated incredible partisanship. Okay. Um, so this is important for us to understand why are we here? Um, what's going on? What is the King's Bench petition about and what does it ask the Pennsylvania Supreme Court? The Pennsylvania Supreme Court is being asked by the widow of Daniel Faulkner to remove Krasner, Larry Krasner, Krasner the so-called uh, progressive DA from the case and transfer the case over to the attorney general's office in Pennsylvania. What the King's Bench petition claims is bias on the part of Larry Krasner's office. Literally, that somehow Larry Krasner's office is in cahoots with Mumia's uh, attorneys. 
what's fascinating about this and what we should acknowledge because our aim is to win and we need to understand the opposition, this is a common strategy on the part of far right-wing reactionary elements in society. They blame the opposition of what they are responsible for. In fact, this is what Trump did over and over again. They throw the ball at you in order to distract attention from the issue. So the Pennsylvania Supreme Court is uh, proved to be biased because Ronald Castile, its chief judge, the chief judge of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court had a conflict of interest. That was established, why? Because he was funded by the Fraternal Order of Police and he was named man of the year by the Fraternal Order of Police. And he said publicly that he wanted to uh, make an example of quote unquote cop killers. That makes him biased. He should never have heard the appellate process. Well now that same court, ironically, cynically, is being asked to stay the process um, because Krasner is, um, is somehow prejudiced. This is the thing. In 2015 or 2014, there was an article in the Inquirer that identified the DA's office in Philadelphia as the deep state. Because there are 300 prosecutors in the DA's office that have systematically worked with police to put black and Latino youth in prison such that Philadelphia is the city that incarcerates more black and Latino youth proportionally than any other county in the country because of the deep state and the power that prosecutors have. You know what happened as soon as Larry Krasner, who's no friend of Mumia, you know what happened when he took office? Where do you think the deep state migrated to? Oh, they migrated to the attorney general's office. So now the Fraternal Order of Police, through the widow of Daniel Faulkner, is asking the goat to watch the lettuce. Take the, the case out of the DA's office, the office of Larry Krasner, and Larry Krasner was elected by the black people, by the black working class people in Philadelphia. What does that count for? Now, the call is for the case to be taken out of the district attorney's office and put in the hands of the attorney uh, general's office in Pennsylvania, the same people who deep sixth or deep nine the boxes. So those were the people who hit the boxes, the six boxes with exculpatory evidence in a demi room within the DA's office. So those are the people who should now investigate claims of prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, it's cynicism of epic proportion. And ultimately this is not just about Mumia because there were over 32 or 100 boxes of other defendants who were found in this back room, uh, hidden from public view for decades. Uh, we have another question. It seems that uh, Lynn Washington wanted to say something when I, did you wanna uh, add to that? I just wanted to add to it. Please. it, it you, you were talking about the extraordinary cynicism here and it, it is um, extraordinarily obscene when the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled against Mumia for the second time in 1998, one of the members was this guy, Ron Castile, who was the former DA at that point of Philadelphia, who had fought against Mumia's appeals. When the case went to the Supreme Court, there was a request that Castile recuse himself based on the ethics code that was in force at the time that said that if a judge had been a former government attorney and knew facts of the case, they needed to get off the case. Castile wrote a lengthy opinion saying why he wasn't gonna get off the case. 
And one of the, in fact, his strongest defense for staying on the case was this. He said that Mumia's defense team has accused him of possible impropriety because he had taken campaign money and campaign support from the Fraternal Order of Police, the organization that at that time was the prime proponent of Mumia being executed. He said that since, you know, why did they target me when four other members of this court have taken money and campaign support from the FOP? So here you have five members of a seven member court in cahoots with the Fraternal Order of Police. Tell me how that is not a gross injustice. And these are the kind of games, well, not games because a man's life is on the line and others, but this is the kind of systemic corruption, the kind of blue suit, black robe corruption that masquerades as justice, not only in Pennsylvania, but across the United States. Thank you. We have another question coming in about uh, the recent statement uh, on the part of the uh, city council in Philadelphia. Uh, so the city council in Philadelphia on Thursday formally voted to apologize for the aerial bombing of uh, the move house in 1985. And the question is, what is the relationship between this bombing of the MOVE organization and uh, Mumia's case? So there's a, a request to comment on the meaning of uh, this, this statement of apology on the part of City Hall about the MOVE bombing of 1985. Uh, and 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 what what it means for Mumia's case? Does anyone want to speak to this? I could address that if you would like. Sure. Okay. In May of 1985, May 13th, 1985, the Philadelphia Police Department dropped a bomb on the Move House in trying to get some members of Move to surrender. That bomb started a fire. The commissioner of police at the time, a guy named Gregor Sambor, gave a direct order to allow the fire to burn. That fire turned into a, an inferno. That inferno killed 11 people inside the move house, including five children, burned down 61 homes, left 250 people homeless. Here we have a connection, uh, a connection but not a direct connection, but is parallel. The then attorney, uh, the then district attorney, Ed Rendell, who had prosecuted Mumia uh, under his administration, went to federal court, in fact, to block a grand jury investigation. He won. His successor, a guy named Ron Castile, the one that we're talking about in the Mumia case, convened a grand jury, came out with a multi hundred page report where he said that there was no crimes committed by the police anywhere, including the police who perjured themselves before the grand jury. So we have Ron Castile whitewashing the move bombing. And then he later, uh, or at the same time is fighting against Mumia's appeals and then later when he gets elected to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, along uh, through support by the FOP, financial and campaign support, then he rules against Mumia uh, having some appeals a couple of times. So again, we just see the gross nature of um, injustice embedded deeply in the justice system of Philadelphia. And that apology, I, I, I want to add, while it was approved by city council, the initiative and the effort to effectuate an apology 
was done by a man named uh, Ulysses Butch Slaughter. He'd been working for uh, over two years to get all of the parties together. Uh, the city council through the new city council person from West Philadelphia where the bombing occurred, uh, Jamie Gaultier, uh, did in fact push the resolution through city council. That was commendable. But I think it's of importance that the members of MOVE and particularly those who have been released after serving more than 40 years in prison for their false or should I say wrongful conviction for killing a police officer during an incident on August 8th, 1978, their position is, we don't want your apology. You killed our family, you killed some of our children. That apology will never bring them back. If your apology is real and sincere and it means something, release Mumia Abu-Jamal. This is their consistent position. So MOVE doesn't want an apology. They want the release of Mumia Abu-Jamal. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here, uh, generally, to Angela Davis, how can we decarcerate? But before we turn it to her, uh, we'd like to invite Mumia Abu-Jamal's grandson, Jamal, to speak. He's, he's in the uh, gallery here with us. Jamal, you can unmute yourself. Common notions? I was actually start you. Oh, okay. Hey, how are we doing today? Can you guys see me? Yes. Um, how are you doing, Joanna? Um, you know, th this has been something that I've been, um, I guess, having to endure, you know, the majority or, or all of my life. Um, and it's just great to see so so many um, organizations uh, coming together uh, and strategizing, and you know figuring out uh, actionable uh, plans to uh, to to get my grandfather free, uh, especially after um, as we saw uh, from uh, various uh, speakers and also in the um, in the media that that was played um, earlier. Uh, if my grandfather didn't have uh, special rules, you know, the, Mum the Mumia rules, you know, uh, th this case will look a lot different. I think we all would agree. Um, right now, uh, especially, you know, after, you know, George Floyd fell, you know, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, Walter Wallace, um, and you know, Breonna Taylor and, count, and countless names after we've, we've been mobilizing all summer and we've, uh, we should be continuing to mobilize, you know, um, through, through into and throughout next year. Uh, I think it's a really, really good time to, uh, to, to have my grandfather's case come to the forefront. Um, there's a lot of individuals who um, who are just uneducated on Mumia's case. There's so much misinformation uh, provided uh, by the Fraternal Order of Police and other, you know, um, journalists who uh, sympathize with their cause. Uh, and right now, we should be on, uh, or we should have the 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 mindset of not only. Uh, you know, shedding light onto his case, but also uh, actively uh, attempting to get him free um, today, right? Uh, this, uh, I had a conversation with uh, with a young man who, uh, who runs a, a local like Instagram account. And, uh, you know, now I, I, this was actually when the, um, when the judge uh, wanted uh, us to look into Mia's trial or felt that it was uh, that we're doing a, a great injustice not looking into Mia's trial again. Um, this is after that. And his comment was, I can't believe we're still fighting for this. This should have been done 25 years ago. Well, th this should have been done 25 years ago, but it's not. And today is the day. Um, yeah, I, I obviously, I'm, I'm grateful that uh, so many people are being um, active. Obviously, I'm grateful for Joanna, Pam. Um, I see Angela Davis on the call. 
you know, and it's it's just great this to see us coming um, forth. Um, I think somebody sent me something. Oh, it's um, it's something else, but um, Joanna, you can you can take over the microphone again if you want. Thank you. We have a question, uh, two questions for Angela. Um, how can we decarcerate is the general question. And the other is, uh, what is the importance and role of supporting political prisoners for the overall project of abolition? Hmm. Well, first of all, um, decarceration is not difficult. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are examples of, of, of uh, prisons um, in the US and in other parts of the world where people have been released uh, uh, because there is no other way to address the threat of COVID-19. Uh, there's, there's no social distancing uh, behind bars. Uh, and, 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 and we know that, that all of the other measures we've been asked to take to protect ourselves from this virus are not possible behind bars. So that the only, um, the only solution, the only effective solution is an abolitionist uh, solution. Uh, simply um, uh, release people uh, who are inside in order to begin to um, reduce the threat of, of uh, COVID-19. And this is not only for the sake of those who will suffer uh, like uh, 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 Russell Maroon Schultz uh, in prison, but for the sake of, of our communities, our entire uh, communities. Uh, uh, the, the most active major clusters of COVID-19 are in our prisons. Um, now, I just want to say that, um, that as we discuss abolition, we should not forget about those who are locked away. We don't necessarily see what is happening in prison as we have seen dramatic and egregious examples of racist police violence. So, but we should uh, know by now that that is precisely why uh, prisons have have sustained themselves uh, because of their um, capacity uh, to render themselves invisible. Uh, and, and so, yeah, simply release people, uh, release people uh, in, in order to minimize the threat of COVID-19. And then that should serve as an example how we can begin to engage in processes of dis decarceration um, more uh, broadly. Um, so what was the other question? And, and the other question is, I'll read it. What is the importance and role of supporting political prisoners for the overall project of abolition? Oh yeah. What's well, the relationship between political imprisonment and abolition? Exactly. Well, you know, first of all, I think that uh, we should all recognize that it was because of the intellectual and activist work of people behind bars that we are talking about abolition uh, today. Uh, uh, people like the Attica brothers, uh, 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 George Jackson, Erica Huggins, many others uh, have created the foundation for us to uh, begin to imagine abolition as a broader uh, strategy. Uh, and, and so um, much of this unfolded as a result of, of the work of political prisoners. And of course, back in the 1970s, we realized that political prisoners were not only those who were directly um, targeted because of their po political beliefs, but by those behind bars who were being kept there because they were attempting to create communities of struggle uh, in prison. And I'm, I'm referring, you know, for example, uh, to uh, George Jackson, whose writings uh, uh, helped to create the foundation uh, for a more, for a, uh, an analysis of the ideological work of the uh, prison system. 
and, and, and certainly of the extent to which it serves as the most dramatic instance of structural racism. Uh, and so um, we're still trying to free political prisoners. Lynette Peltier should not be be behind bars. Uh, uh, the many members of the Black Panther Party who are still in prison should not be behind bars. Uh, my co-defendant uh, during my trial in 1972, Rochelle McGee has been in prison well over a half a century. Uh, and, and so I think that as we go about uh, the, the, the work of attempting to um, point out the viability of abolitionist solutions, we should especially call for the freedom of Mumia, uh, Abu Jamal, and all political prisoners. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Uh, we have a few more questions here and uh, still expecting uh, a statement coming anytime now. Um, the question is, who is Chobert? Uh, it's a very confusing person in this trial. Who is Chobert, Robert Chobert? Lynn, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, I could take that. And I can uh, fully understand with uh, all of these names and places and players and years and actually decades, it's hard to keep everything in order. During the original trial, there were basically two prime witnesses for the prosecution. One was a guy named Robert Chobert, uh, who was a cab driver, who claimed that he saw Mumia shoot Officer Faulkner. The other was a prostitute named Cynthia White, who claimed that she also saw it. Uh, now, interestingly, in terms of where they both were, they were no more than 10 feet from each other, but neither of them said that they saw each other. Robert Chover's testimony was that he was driving a cab. He pulled in behind Officer Faulkner's car to start working on his uh, cab log. And then he saw the events take place while looking out the front window of his car and that would be in the middle of the night it's dark he looks through officer faulkner's car that has his flashing lights on look through the volkswagen of mumia's brother billy cook and then sees mumia shoot the uh, police officer what is problematic about robert chober's testimony is uh, a couple of things number one at the time that he claimed that he saw what he saw, he was on probation for firebombing a school and he was driving without a license because uh, that was taken away from him twice for drunk driving. So would a person who is essentially doing something illegal, driving a car without a license and a person who is then on probation, would that person drive up behind a police officer? Absolutely not. Um, Chobert has given uh, conflicting statements outside of court, unfortunately. He claims that he in fact was not behind the police officer's car, but was parked uh, on an, in another location and observed some things through his rear view mirror. So the short answer in terms of who is Chobert is that Chobert was one of the prosecution's two prime witnesses against Abu Jamal. His testimony was suspect. The trial judge, uh, Albert Sabo, the one who said he was gonna help prosecutors fry the N-word, uh, refused to allow the jury to hear that Chobert was a convicted arsonist who was driving without a license. Uh, Sabo said it would be unfair, essentially, to Chober's testimony if the jury heard that information. Well, if the jury heard that information, they may have thought that this person may not be telling the truth and may have had incentive to lie so he would stay out of prison. Because uh, if his probation was revoked, he would have had to serve five to seven years in prison for that arson. And as we know now from the boxes that were found in uh, Krasner's office, that Chobert had written the prosecutor after the trial and said, where's my money? Now, he didn't say, where's my lunch money? 
where's my bus money? He said, where's my money? Which would seem to indicate that there was some sort of promise made between the prosecutor and Chobert uh, that he would be paid for his testimony. You can stay right there. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are imminently expecting a video from a very important uh, person in um, our society. Uh, and that's, that's coming, literally the video is spooling or being transferred. Uh, but in the meantime, we have a question uh, as a black journalist for Lynn, as a black journalist in Philadelphia, what role do you see media playing in Mumia's initial frame up and ongoing incarceration? What is the role of the media in the FOP's agenda? What responsibility do journalists have and what role does media have in general on the question of uh, incarceration, but also Mumia's freedom? Uh, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> Let me start at kind of like the, the end and then work back. Journalists' role is to be accurate in what they report. They're supposed to be truthful and honest and do this with integrity. That's what the ethics provisions say. Uh, journalists' role is to inform the public and to serve as a watchdog on government. That's why the, there is the First Amendment freedom of a press clause. Now let's roll it back to um, December of 1981 going into uh, January through 19, uh, July of 1982 uh, during the pendency and the trial of Mumia Abu Jamal. Initially the coverage of Mumia was so bad that even some journalists came forward and said this is wrong they are not covering this fairly and accurately. Every ugly thing that they could come up with is what they, uh, was what they were publishing. They were painting Mumia as a radical, somebody who was undeserving of any benefit of the doubt or of uh, benefiting of the rights to have innocence uh, until guilt is proven. Uh, he's a member of the Black Panther Party. Listen, I hung out with Mumia when we were working as journalists before his arrest and also um, just on a friendship level, you know, two guys together. He never talked about being a Black Panther. Uh, that was dug up. Uh, they also were saying that uh, he's a radical and, and he's crazy because he was the president of the Philadelphia chapter of the Marijuana Users Association of America. And again, understand the context of the time. In the 1970s, it was just a few years after marijuana had been re-illegalized by the federal government. There was a lot of uh, uh, civil trials. There was a lot of legislative action to try to take marijuana out of the category of making it comparable to a heroin and other drugs that had no medicinal purposes. So the coverage initially of Mumia's case was just outrageous. In that, there was an attitude by reporters in Philadelphia that anybody who's black and radical, and particularly anybody who has any association with MOVE is undeserving of any kind of fair treatment. Now, this is very interesting. By the time that we get to the mid 90s and Mumia's appeal uh, was taking place before the uh, Judge Sabo again, uh, under the auspices of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Sabo's behavior was so outrageous that members of Philadelphia's media, columnists, reporters, as well as editorial boards were highly critical of Sabo to the point that the both the, the two largest newspapers in the city, the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia D Daily News, both read, read editorials saying Sabo needs to be taken off the case. The coverage by hundreds of journalists from around the world was so negative in terms of showing the corrupt behaviors of Sabo that that material was a part of the appeal that went to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And the argument was that, hey, you don't believe our legal arguments, 
Look at what journalists have written about it, including journalists who hate Mumia's guts. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court, when they got to that issue, said this blithely. They said the opinions of a handful of journalists do not convince us that Sabo essentially was not corrupt, it was not biased, and then acted in a very unjudicial manner. That phrase, handful of journalists, is quite deceptive because technically a handful means six or less or whatever you can put in your hand. The editorial boards of the Inquirer and the Daily News was more than 20 people combined. So that was more than a handful. So the Pennsylvania Supreme Court deliberately ignored the coverage and particularly the coverage that was critical of the way Sabo was conducting and really marauding over that case. In recent years, coverage of Mumia from journalists has changed somewhat because a new crop of journalists have come in. So now you see that there is some recognition in the coverage that there may be some problems with the structural aspects of Mumia's um, conviction. They are not saying that Mumia is innocent. They're not saying that Mumia has been railroaded, but now you do see this recognition that there are serious problems uh, in Mumia's case. What journalists should do in terms of coverage is being accurate and fair, and also to do what is in the provision of the Society of Professional Journalists ethics code, and that is give voice to the voiceless. Report on the people that you don't normally hear about, and that would include prisoners and others who have been wrongfully treated by the justice system. And I wanna make one final point. At the time that Mumia was practicing his award-winning journalism in Philadelphia from 1976 through 1980, he was known as the voice of the voiceless because of his empathy, because of his true concern for reporting not only at the top of society, but at the grassroots, he was called voice of the voiceless. That provision in the ethics code of the Society of Professional Journalists to give voice to the voiceless did not enter that ethics code until the mid 1990s. So Mumia was reporting on the, as the voice of the voiceless years before the organization that represents or purports to represent journalists saw that that was something that they needed to do. Thank you. We have another question and four minutes to go for a video that is about to be um, sent to us, less than four minutes to go. Uh, the question is, um, just one second, I wanna read it. This is for Angela Davis. Um, uh, can we have abolition without altering the role of the state? Can we have abolition without altering the role of the state? And Okay, well, yeah, that's a big question. Um, uh, we, uh, abolition is not necessarily a state that uh, we reach, um, uh, but rather a process. Uh, and that process requires us to um, critically examine and reimagine uh, the way in which our society is structured. Uh, um, it, it, it involves uh, recognizing uh, that uh, prisons and police cannot be abolished uh, without at the same time creating new institutions uh, uh, that can more effectively address uh, the reasons why currently so many people are subject to state violence, to the violence of, 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 of uh, imprisonment, the violence of the police. Uh, so I would, you know, one answer would be no, uh, we cannot have abolition without um, reimagining the role of the state. Uh, uh, 
but perhaps even more importantly, reimagining the socioeconomic conditions uh, more uh, broadly. Uh, and um, uh, I suppose I could say that um, abolition is, is um, also a, a pathway toward a, a more effective, uh, more capacious uh, democracy. It helps us to rethink the meaning of democracy uh, and calls upon us uh, to change, um, transform, recreate, abolish, rebuild uh, those institutions that continue to uh, perpetuate uh, structural and systemic racism. Angela, there's a follow-up question here that was attached to that one, and that is, what lessons can today's anti-police and prisons organizers and organizations learn from earlier moments in the abolitionist movement? Well, I would answer by saying that this particular conjuncture uh, was rendered possible precisely uh, as a consequence of the ongoing work of, of, of activists, of intellectuals, of artists, of, and especially of prisoners, and especially of political prisoners. Uh, um, I, I think that uh, an impetus for our um, struggle to free Mumia at this moment uh, has to do with the fact that his contributions uh, from uh, behind bars from death row, help us to create a new terrain, uh, help to um, engage in a kind of popular education that has finally uh, resulted in larger numbers of people recognizing the structural and systemic character of racism. So I would, 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 would say that um, what we are experiencing at this moment resides on a continuum uh, uh, that goes back to those in, in the 60s, the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and, and prisoners, especially during uh, the 1960s and the 70s uh, and the 80s who have kept alive uh, our uh, struggles for justice and equality even when the activism has not been as widespread uh, in the so-called uh, free world. Thank you, Angela. And I think we are ready now. We're ready now to play the statement that we've been waiting for. Um, I'm sure that it will be without, it's without introduction. Can you when I was invited to speak on behalf of Mumia, one of the first things that came to mind was how long he's been in prison. How many years of his life have been stolen away from him, his community, and his loved ones. He's been incarcerated for 38 years. Mumia has been in prison longer than I've been alive. When I first spoke with Mumia on the phone, I did very little talking. I just listened. Hearing him speak was a reminder of why we must continue to fight. Earlier this year, the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner issued a statement noting that prolonged solitary confinement, the precise type often used in the United States, amounts to psychological torture. Mumia Abu Jamal has spent roughly 30 out of his 38 years in solitary confinement. In his book, Live from Death Row, Mumia wrote that prison is a second-by-second -second assault on the soul, a day-to-day -day degradation of the self, an oppressive steel and brick umbrella that transforms seconds into hours and hours into days. He has had to endure this second-by-second -second assault on his soul for 38 years. He had no record before he was arrested and framed for the death of a Philadelphia police officer. Since 1981, Mumia has maintained his innocence. 
his story has not changed. Mumia was shot, brutalized, arrested, and chained to a hospital bed. The first police officer assigned to him wrote in a report that the Negro male made no comment, as cited in Philly Mag. Yet 64 days into the investigation, another officer testified that Mumia had confessed to the killing. Mumia's story has not changed. But we are talking about the same Philadelphia Police Department whose behavior shocks the conscious, according to a 1979 DOJ report. Behaviors like shooting nonviolent suspects, abusing handcuffed prisoners, and tampering with evidence. It should therefore come as little surprise that according to Dr. Johanna Fernandez, over one third of the 35 officers involved in Mumia's case were subsequently convicted of rank corruption, extortion, and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions in unrelated cases. This is the same Philadelphia Police Department We've lost sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've lost sound and we're trying to get the sound back for everybody. We've lost sound, but we're gonna try to get this fixed as soon as possible. And you're hearing the words of Colin Kaepernick, the person who has sacrificed everything to stand up against police terror in this country. He has uh, made a special statement on the case of Mumia Abu Jamal and the broader crisis of hyper incarceration of black and Latinx people in the United States. We are just waiting for our tech folks to get a sound and this is a press conference sponsored by the movement to free Mumia Abu Jamal. And we called this conference because this is a critical moment in the case of Mumia Abu Jamal and other political prisoners. Or Carter, that they relentingly campaigned for Mumia's yeah, execution. <laughs> During their August 1999 national meeting, a spokesperson for the organization stated that they will not rest until Abu Jamal burns in hell. The former Philadelphia president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Richard Costello, went as far as to say that if you disagree in hours into days, he has had to endure this second by second assault on his soul for 38 years. He had no record before he was arrested and framed for the death of a Philadelphia police officer. Since 1981, Mumia has maintained his innocence. His story has not changed. Mumia was shot, brutalized, arrested, and chained to a hospital bed. The first police officer assigned to him wrote in a report that the Negro male made no comment, as cited in Philly Mag. Yet 64 days into the investigation, another officer testified that Mumia had confessed to the killing. 
Mumia's story has not changed. But we are talking about the same Philadelphia Police Department whose behavior shocks the conscious, according to a 1979 DOJ report. Behaviors like shooting nonviolent suspects, abusing handcuffed prisoners, and tampering with evidence. It should therefore come as little surprise that according to Dr. Johanna Fernandez, over one third of the 35 officers involved in Mumia's case were subsequently convicted of rank corruption, extortion, and tampering with evidence to obtain convictions in unrelated cases. This is the same Philadelphia Police Department where officers ran racial profiling sweeps like Operation Cold Turkey in March 1985 targeting black and brown folks and bombed the move house in May of that year, killing 11 people, including five children and destroying 61 homes. The same Philadelphia Police Department whose officers eight days before the 2020 presidential election shot Walter Wallace Jr. dead in the streets in front of his crying mother. The Philadelphia Fraternal Order of Police has unrelentingly campaigned for Mumia's execution. During their August 1999 national meeting, a spokesperson for the organization stated that they will not rest until Abu Jamal burns in hell. The former Philadelphia president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Richard Costello, went as far as to say that if you disagree with their views of Mumia, you can join him in the electric chair and that they will make it an electric couch. The trial judge on Mumia's case in 1981, Albert Sabo, was a former member of the Fraternal Order of Police. Court reporter Terry Moore Carter overheard Judge Sabo telling a colleague, I'm going to help them fry the nigger. Found in December 2018 in an inaccessible storage room of the DA's office, six boxes of documents from Mumia's case reveal previously undisclosed and highly significant evidence showing that Mumia's trial was tainted by a failure to disclose material evidence in violation of the United States and Pennsylvania constitutions. In November 2019, the Fraternal Order of Police filed a King's Bench petition asking the court to allow the state attorney general, not the Philadelphia DA's office, to handle the upcoming appeals. As the FOP president John McNesby said, just last year, Mumia should remain in prison for the rest of his life. And a King's Bench order provides the legal angle for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to uphold Judge Sabo's original wish, which was for Mumia ultimately to die in prison. Today we are living through a moment where it's acceptable to paint end racism now in front of the Philadelphia Police Department's 26th District Headquarters. And yet a political prisoner who has since the age of 14 dedicated his life to fighting against racism continues to be caged and lives his life on a slow death row. We're in the midst of a movement that says Black Lives Matter. And if that's truly the case, then it means that Mumia's life and legacy must matter. And the causes that he sacrificed his life and freedom for must matter as well. Through all of the torture Mumia has suffered over the past 38 years, his principles have never wavered. These principles have manifested themselves in his writing countless books while incarcerated, in his successful radio show, in the time and energy he has poured into his mentorship of younger incarcerated folks and the continued concern with the people suffering outside of the walls. Even while living in the hells of the prison system, Mumia still fights for our human rights. We must continue to fight for him and his human rights. Mumia is 66 years old. He is a grandfather. He is an elder with ailments. He is a human being that deserves to be free. Free Mumia. You've been listening to the words of Colin Kaepernick. 
that are uh, beyond compare. And I'd like to bring in Santiago Alvarez to comment on the statement, but also read a bio for Colin Kaepernick. All right. Yeah, that was a powerful, powerful video. And first of all, I just want to really thank Johanna Fernandez for her, um, you know, amazing work in pulling that video together and pulling so much of this press conference together too. Um, uh, yeah, so we also want to, um, before we get into the bio, we want to um, ask people to um, stay involved with this movement. Um, there's a lot of information that we're um, going through during this uh, press conference, and it's really important for folks to, to stay involved. So. Um, there's some ways to contact us um, through email, um, and that would be mobilization for mumia at gmail.com. And it's the number four, so mobilization for mumia at gmail.com. Um, that's also a website, mobilization for mumia.com. Um, and We've also got a link tree, so L-I-N-K-T-R dot e, -E. Um, And if you go there, uh, you know, it's gonna be something that's like a project that will be constantly updated. Um, so if you check that out, um, we'll have Mumia's latest uh, reports and essays and commentary. We'll have videos, educational information, additional readings. Um, I also want to um, bring up that uh, Mumia wrote a, um, an essay for Colin Kaepernick's series entitled Abolition for the People um, just this month. And so, um, and uh, Angela Davis contributed to that as well and wrote an essay. Um, so there's a lot of things that are going on with uh, the movement to free Mumia. And, um, you know, Mumia may be physically, um, you know, inside, but he is mentally like so, so free. And we have so much to learn from him. And he's always giving um, so much of his wisdom and knowledge. Um, so I really encourage folks to tap in on social media as well. Um, you know, on Facebook, it's mobilization for the number four Mumia. Um, Instagram and Twitter, it's bring Mumia home. And on YouTube, uh, you're streaming now on Mumia campaign. So who is Colin Kaepernick? Um, Colin Kaepernick was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1987, um, an athletic and mobile quarterback. Kaepernick attended the University of Nevada, Reno, where he set several school and college records, and the San Francisco 49ers drafted Colin Kaepernick in 2011. And he led the club to a Super Bowl uh, less than two years later. In 2016, Colin Kaepernick drew attention for refusing to stand for the national anthem, a form of protest that was adopted by many other players and became a hot button political topic. He filed a grievance against NFL owners and the following year, uh, he filed a grievance against NFL owners the following year for colluding to keep him out of the league before agreeing to a confidential settlement in February 2019. Um, so, uh, I don't know, jo Johnny, do you want me to keep on? Um, I, I'd like to give it to Angela to conclude um, this press conference. Uh, and I'll just reiterate that we'd like folks to demand the immediate release of Russell Maroon Schultz, whose life um, is in the balance right now because he has stage four cancer and COVID-19. 
and we've given you the numbers uh, previously, uh, we'd also like to remind you to, to join uh, the movement to free Mumia, uh, which is also part of a broader movement for justice in this country and for abolition. And you can go to mobilization for mumia.org. Uh, you could also email us at bringmumiahome.com. And uh, I'd like to just say that Black Americans uh, in this country, because of their, because of their condition of enslavement as Africans in a previous period, uh, have always forced this country to come to terms with, with its contradictions, that it professes democracy and justice, but in fact creates uh, violence and exploitation uh, and uh, and horror in the streets uh, for the for the uh, for the uh, for those people who are part of this of of of, 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 and of this gener previous generation of enslaved Africans, but also other other racialized uh, people of color. And be, because of the role of slavery in this country, um, black people have always put a mirror to, um, to, to this country and, and forced it to, uh, to make good on its promise of democracy. And it's always the, the descendants of enslaved Africans who take to the streets um, and inspire the nation and the world to fight for a different world. And, and we are in one of those moments when, the, um, when this generation uh, is, is saying that there's something profoundly wrong with this country, with our society and structural racism and the legacy of slavery is, is part of that crisis that we must reckon with and come to terms with. And this crisis of incarceration and police violence is, is at the core of that. And, and this is a moment when, when those of us like Angela Davis who've been fighting around this issue of abolition are coming together with uh, sports heroes like Colin Kaepernick to, to say that, that it's the moment for a new America and a new world um, to emerge. We've gathered here for Mumia, but this is not just a struggle to free Mumia and political prisoners. This is really a struggle for this, for ourselves. This is a struggle for the liberation of our society, for fighting for a country that will respect life amidst of, of a pandemic. And so uh, I just wanna thank everyone who, who's worked hard to pull this event together. It's not been easy, but we hope to offer it uh, to, to those who continue to struggle in the streets um, to amplify uh, the value of black life uh, in this country and around the world. And I just would like to give it to Angela to um, take us out. Uh, well, you know, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone on this call, and especially Johanna Fernandez, who has been indefatigable in her work on behalf of Mumia. Um, the words of everyone on the call, from Pam and Lynn and Dwight and Kwame and, Santi and Santiago, um, uh, to the last speaker, uh, Colin Kaepernick, have enlightened us uh, and let me thank Colin for his consistency in the struggle against racist state violence, just as he did not hesitate to take a knee when he knew full well that his future was at stake. Now he has not hesitated to join the demand to free Mumia Abu Jamal. This is our challenge. This is our 
This is the major challenge of this conjuncture. Free Russell Maroon Schultz, free all political prisoners, free Mumia, decarcerate our prisons and forward to an abolitionist, anti-racist, feminist, and democratic future. Thank you.